So welcome everyone to today's webinar where we are discussing these secrets to driving sales velocity in retail. A lot of these things, I will tell you, they're not so secret, but they're some of the core fundamentals that you need to know and keep top of mind to make sure that you can see success as you are building your business. I obviously have experience selling in retail through my previous CPG brand, T-Squares, but I want to bring on an expert to really go through a lot of the details who's doing this day in, day out. So I'd like to introduce Luke Abbott, who is the founder of V-Driven Consulting. Luke works with brands in a variety of ways, but one that's really important today is really helping brands strategize on retail get into the stores, and then most importantly, make sure your product is moving off the shelf while it is there. Luke, welcome to the webinar today. Jordan, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. And I have, I want to say the utmost respect for you and your community. Thank you for what you're doing for our supply chain. Of course, of course. And I know you talk with a lot of brands as well. It's a struggle out there in the CPG <laughs> world right now. Everything from reaching consumers to working with retailers, there's a lot of opportunities, but a yes. lot of challenges as well. And I, to our brands joining in, I see your struggles, I feel your struggles, and it is tough. So Luke, why don't you walk us through as well in what that looks like for kind of succeeding in retail and how brands can have a better chance of being successful. Yeah, I love it. I um, have a presentation here. Let me share it one second. Actually, I pressed the wrong button. Let's try one more time. And tell me if you see this okay, Jordan. That looks perfect. Perfect. Okay. So just um, Jordan did a great job introducing me. Just want to make sure that everyone understands a little bit about, little bit about my background. I started in this industry when I was 21 at a food distributor called Monterey Provision. Uh, worked my way up from the bottom, had the opportunity to buy it from the founder after working there 14 years. We were about a, we were at that time about a $30 million distributor. My team and I went on an amazing journey growing it into a national distributor um, that we sold to Kehi in 2016. And at Kehi, I was the president of the Fresh Division um, for a couple of years. And then I thought, hey, retail would be fun. So I worked at uh, Jimbo's. Anyone that doesn't know Jimbo's, you need to know Jimbo's. Uh, he is really the father of organics in the United States, and he founded an organization called Infra, which allows um, over 500 store doors of natural retailers to all buy together and, frankly, be able to compete with the Cold Foods and Sprouts. Um, after I left Jimbo's, started V Driven, and that's where I'm at today. And originally, I was an investor. Um, I haven't had any exits, so I'm not a successful investor, but um, had a lot of fun. And then I uh, was able to create this really fun company I have today uh, with about 60 team members, about 65 brands. And um, we do a number of things, um, including representing brands into the, into the natural channel, doing consulting, accounting division. We fight deductions. We, we have a lot of stuff that we do, and we're having so much fun. I also, in the last year, have been a professor of supply chain at the University of San Diego. And what's fun is I threw away the textbook and made it all about our food supply chain. And the kids in the class are just enthralled. Little did they know how hard it is to get food onto a shelf and then off. And I also have the Reconnected, Reconnected podcast um, where I'm seeking to kind of humanize our industry. So definitely a lot of time in this space and really excited to share with you the things that I've learned and I pray that you get a lot of value from this. So today we'll We'll start with this idea of the core. It's a concept I came up with when I was first uh, starting V Driven, and I think it'll re really be relevant to you. We'll talk about this, all this stuff that needs to happen before we hit the shelf, um, and then what we do once we're on the shelf, and then how do we know if we're winning, uh, tracking our success. So um, like Jordan said, we're going to have plenty of time for, for conversation and questions. Um, this presentation will take about 20, 25 minutes, and then uh, we'll dig into your questions. So let's keep on going. So the core here on the right, the idea of the core is if I get the things in the core right about my product, um, my chances of driving velocity efficiently at shelf is going to be greatly improved. And I can do it at a much, much lower cost than if I don't get the core right. So do I have the right product at the right time? Um, so many brands, Jordan, they don't think about COGS. It's like, we'll think about that later. It's like, especially in today's world, like you commented, this is a very different world than two years ago. The, de the democratization of venture capital is gone. <laughs> so either check these boxes or you're, you're not raising capital. So having COGS that are, that allow you to hit the right retail for your product is absolutely critical. Um, having the right production co-manufacturing partner, 
and certainly branding and packaging. I work with so many D2C brands that are breaking into retail and what you do online doesn't work on shelves generally, where the branding and packaging has to do all the heavy lifting. So here's the deal. If you don't get all these, that's okay. Like we can go drive, we can go drive velocity, but we're going to be spending a crazy amount of money on marketing levers, PR, um, you know, promotions, placement fees. And a great example of placement fees, by the way, is just last week I was um working with a buyer, finishing a review. We had um, we had three lines that were being authorized, and one of the lines he was particularly excited about. Like this product is the right product at the right time at the right SRP, and the packaging and branding was right. And instead of a two case free fill, we were able to get a half case. That savings for this brand was fifty thousand dollars, right? So it's 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 very real. If your product is one that the buyer has to have it because it checks all these boxes. Oh man, we can save a lot of money and be much more capital efficient. So I'll go into this a little bit further. Um, so this idea of I call it the, this idea of flow velocity is where I have the strong core, which is effectively this beautiful chat GPT generated image of like the water is flowing. It's just beautiful, right? And it's like what well, where I don't have a strong core, we have a weak core, and I'm making up for it, right? For to achieve the same velocity all these dollar signs are required to kind of force the water, if you will, up, up the stream, right? Where in the strong core flow, it just, it just flows on its own. So I think that's the visual I want you to take away from this is, is like, I want to be here. <laughs> so Luke, that looks the so investment nice. up front, right? <laughs> where, like, imagine being on an inner tube there, Jordan, and just like flowing down the river <laughs> that that's where we want to be. Um, so let's, let's dig in here a little bit. So we're going to talk about like the getting ready. So define winning, Cash, so critical. Uh, how much cash is it going to take, right? And so I, how many times have, I don't know, Jordy, if you've heard of a brand, I got, I got sprouts, but then they understand what the costs are. Like, well, I didn't, I can't do sprouts. So it's really important to understand that. Um, community more and more important than ever in terms of your ability to have a community that can drive intent to buy is, I, I hear this over and over from retailers, is the number one indicator of success of a brand that checks all the boxes in the core Community is what makes it happen. Um, having your supply chain operating well and certainly promotions in place at the right time because often promotions need to be submitted way before you think they do. So let's dig in. Luke, can I tell you a quick story as well? Yeah, of course. Before you get into this, why it's so important. When I launched my brand, T-Squares, we launched in, I think it was like 100 or so uh, Mariano stores at the time, which is mm. now owned by Kroger. And my whole thought was, hey, let's get in the store. We'll put the products in and see what happens, right? Mm. Like the product will just sell itself and learn quickly <laughs> that that's not how it works. And so I love kind of this process that you're thinking about, like all the different things that you need to think of when you're launching into the store versus seeing that as the end goal of like, hey, mm. we launched, we're good. High five. High five, Jordan. We did it. Yes. <laughs> it's like, a year later, like you're crying. It's like, ah, um, I've seen this way too often. And so like, this is a community service, right? This is like, I've seen this way too, too often. And if we can get the word out that we can avoid pain. So let's do it. Thank you for that, Jordan. And um, this idea of, of like, always clarify what winning looks like. I got to tell you, most brokers don't even think about this. Like ask the buyer, what is the goal velocity? <laughs> Right. So they authorize you. What does winning look like? Where, where will you be happy with my product on shelf? Um, so the, I, I think I, every time I ask, I get an answer and then I know what to aim for. And so it's, that's really, this is like pro tip number one. I need to know what winning looks like. Cause I, I've had so many brands tell me, oh, I'm doing great. We're moving two units per SKU per store per week. And then we go look at spins and the average of the category is six. And then, but no one ever asked the buyer. So that's critical. Have you found Every, that buyers are open about that? Oh yeah. 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 The, the, the one exception would be where we were launching something that was way higher in retail than anything else on the shelf. It was a premium um, almond milk line that we were working with and we were $2 higher. And he's like, you know what? I just know I want that type of consumer coming into my store. And so I'm less concerned, like this is more of a destination item that will, and you have a huge audience that will now come shopping my store. If we can sell two or three when the average is seven or eight, I'm okay, but I'm not really holding you to a number. That, that, that has happened, but it's not very common. But, but in general, we that, will tell you what it looks like. One thing that surprised me as well when I was selling in Whole Foods is that the buyer looked at velocity by case and not by Crazy. unit. Crazy. And yeah. our unit or our case size was, we were selling, right? Like 
uh, multi-pack energy bars Drink it. Energy bites. <laughs> and our case was 16 units Ooh. and then we took that and like halved it to eight because like if their measure success is case and not units then like let's make that a little bit easier on ourselves you know and, and this goes back to the point like what does winning look like it's going to be different for every buyer and so in this case knowing that is huge and the other thing to point out in what you just said it's why i, I typically retailers today do not want back stock so you want to have six or eight typically is the quantity for most CPG products today, but that, but having six versus 16 also lowers the cost of your free fill. And this is something just be really, really mindful of because free fills can kill you when you're you know, launching a 500 store chain, right? Or 2000 store chain. Right. Right on. So let's see, did I get this? Yep. Clarify. And then leveraging information from key advisors, brokers, distributors, retailers, um, to understand the costs involved. So something like we do at V driven for our clients is we have an ROI model we've built out where you can put in like, Hey, what is the, what is the uh, launch cost look like in terms of the, um, you know, what is the, what is the fill pre fill going to cost you? How many ads, what are the costs of the ads? Um, the TPRs are built out over a year and it actually builds out like this kind of ROI calculator. When do you break hit break even? When are you profitable? Uh, what are the costs of the promos? What does the cash outflow look like? Because it's, it's, these are things that, most brands that are younger tend to not really think through the cost. Oh, I got launched at fresh time. Well, okay. There's a free fill. Well, that, that's fine. It's just, it's just what I charge Kahi. No, it's not. The free fill is built back to you and they've raised these up, Jordan. The, they're now marking up 40% to get to their highest list price. And they don't, so they don't bill you back for they charge fresh time. They bill you back for the highest list price that nobody ever pays which again is a reason to have a smaller case size, pace back, right? For the free fill. Um, crazy stuff, right? The setup fees, the the 15% required OIs when you set up in a new distribution center. There's all these costs you need to be thinking about because it's like cash is critical and the ability to support promotions has to be there or merchandising and other things, other levers. And if all the money just goes for the free fill, then what do we really accomplish? We may never really get a chance to show what we can do velocity wise. Luke, I love that you have this calculator. Do you have a sense of like either when it usually takes a brand to break even or a goal that they should be looking at? I know it yeah. varies. So I would say this. Number one is a brand launching in retail today um, needs visibility to at least a 45% gross margin and ideally 50 to 55%. 55% you can start being reasonably profitable. So if you're between 45 and 55%, you typically like let's say launching at Sprouts, I just did a model yesterday for a client. They were profitable at month 11 um, at, at a reasonable gross margin that they were. So th they, this goes back to the core and COGS, right? And maybe I'll just make this very bold statement, Jordan. Every penny more you are paying for your cost of goods is money you're throwing in a dumpster, you're pouring kerosene on it and launching it on fire. You need to be very, very, very focused on your cogs. There's never an excuse to pay more than you should. So just my strong opinion on that one. Um, because margin, yeah. If you and if you especially if you want to raise capital in the future, like if we if we can't have visibility to 45% plus gross margin, like we're not going to be able to raise capital from any sophisticated investor, in my opinion. So makes sense. Okay. Yep. Um, brands that build communities. Again, this is this is different. Five years ago, I would have said this didn't matter. Check the box, have an Instagram page, you do TikTok. Um, I actually just did a reconnected podcast episode with the CEO of this company. I don't know if you know Ari Roz. Um, Jordan, he's an amazing CEO. Yep. Um, I have yep. some uh their yogurt than uh my fridge now. Yeah, me too. It's amazing. And and um, this is the founder of the company. And he just has an iPhone. He talks into the iPhone authentically. It's not polished. It's not at all. It's not beautiful, but he's he has a compelling, a compelling, I guess, value proposition for this product. It fits right into the gut health craze going on right now. And he just tells the story. And what I've noticed, and I don't know if this is truly how it works, but I sense that on TikTok, they're able to touch millions of, of views per post sometimes. And then people get more curious and then they become part of like the Instagram community. That, that's where you get more intimate in my opinion. And then, um, but it's working. Mm -hmm. And with this, he had to open a new um, plant up in up in Utah. He still can't keep up with production. He, I think he shared in my podcast, he went from making a thousand units, I think it was the day up to 10,000 in the last four years and he still can't keep up with production. Um, so I look at this, I look at this and I think one of his goals is to share with the, CPG community that you can do this without having a budget. 
like you, like, like I challenge everybody on this call on this, on this zoom, do what this man's doing. Check out coconut cult, check out other people like him. They're having success, just being vulnerable and honest about their product. Cool. And if you do that, then you say, Hey, we're launching at sprouts We're launching at whole foods. Now you're driving intent to buy. People are walking into those stores, curious and looking for your products. And if I can go to a buyer and share with them that I already have this community and they're motivated and look what happened at this chain, look what happened over here. They're more likely to bring you in because you're going to grow their category. Okay. Never underestimate the importance of your supply chain. I imagine Jordan, you went through this, right? It's like, like, Hey, I got a huge opening order. Does the opening order make sense? Is it 10 cases per store? Right. Well, typically you only need about two cases per store for an opening order for a distribution center, maybe three. And if you're seeing 10 and you have a, something that has a six month shelf life, you're probably gonna be throwing product away. So like one thing to remember is that we need to look at our distributors as drayage companies, which means effectively they're like a 3PL. I get that they place orders with you. You cannot trust that. Do not trust anything your distributor does. Double check everything for does this make sense with the reality of my life? <laughs> What's going on? Um, because otherwise you will be, you'll be buried. I've seen it happen way, way too often. Um, does the date of the PO work relative to other retailer or to the retailer reset date? So the distributor placed an order. Does it make sense that they're bringing it in two days before the reset? Here's what happens. If you get product into a store after the resets already happened, Oftentimes it doesn't get on shelf until they go back through again a month or two later, or even three months later to go back and make sure the sets are, are really tidy. So make sure that's tight. Did their product make it into the cross stock DCs on time? Did their product ship out to the stores? Oh gosh, a, um, a good friend of mine owns um, like the, what do you call it? Like an overnight oats company, got the sprouts launch and got followed everything they were told to do. But the, um, but the retailer never told the distributor when to plus out the product into the stores and it probably ended up going out of code. They threw away tens and tens of thousands of dollars of product. So guess what? With um, KE Connect, for example, you can go in every single day and see what's happening in those distribution centers relative to your product. Do not ever assume that, that what you think is going to happen is going to happen. You need to verify. Um, absolutely critical. Otherwise product won't be there. The, the buyer's holding you accountable for growing the category and your product's not on shelf not your fault. You're still accountable, um, generally. So, uh, okay. Retail, re okay. Larger retailer promotions. So you've been authorized. I'm excited. I'm getting my KHE Unify set up. And then it's like, um, remember that, that promotions need to be submitted in advance and that you're only new on shelf once, right? So typically we don't ever promote month one because you're still dealing with supply chain issues and merchandising month two, you promote and but in some retailers, you need to submit that that um, promotion six months in advance or four months in advance. So make sure the first thing you're doing is executing the submission of those of those promotions to your retailers. Um, so to make sure you get a chance to launch out of the gate. I've had too many brands that I work with um, where they didn't want to do a promotion or whatever, and it's like three months in, you're getting kicked out. Six months in, you're getting kicked out. Like and they're like, "Wow, I worked so hard, didn't give me a chance." The retailers don't owe you anything right? You're taking space on their shelves for the promise that you're going to grow their category. That's your job, not theirs. So it's um, something they have to be really, really mindful of. So, okay. Core component, core components that will define your success at shelf, uh, demos, merchandising, promotion, optimization, account management, marketing. So assuming you did everything else right that I just talked about, this is now I'm on shelf. How do I get off shelf? Luke, can so, I just uh, yeah. really, really emphasize the point you just made about it's the brand's responsibility to make sure the product is moving off the shelf. Because I think that's something that I was very naive on going in is yep. thinking that like, Hey, my job is to make the product. I get to the distributor, they get to the retailer. And then the retailer's job is to sell the product because they have the relationship with the customer in store at least. And I found that that's right. Not true. It's oftentimes the brand's responsibility to make sure their specific product is moving all the way until it gets to the consumer's house. Yes. And that they like it. <laughs> Once they get it there. <laughs> yeah, if they so, like it, yeah, and come back. Yeah, I yeah, I remember uh, when one brand I was meeting with and uh, it was a salsa company or sauce company, Mexican sauce company. And and he was so upset that the that the Whole Foods employees weren't merchandising his product. That it was just sitting in the back. And he's, he starts, he tells me, he tells me the story about yelling at the team at Whole Foods. And I'm just like, 
okay, you know what? They have no responsibility to you. And you doing this, they're going to make sure your product is never merchandised. Like we, it's just, it doesn't feel fair. I get it. And and yet this is market. And we have to, we have to understand that, that this is the, the, the path that we've chosen. <laughs> so we need to show up fully. Um, demos. Jordan, Jordan, demos are so expensive. I used to own a national in-store demonstration company. We had the exclusive contract at Fresh Time and Sprouts. And so I know a lot about this. Number one is do not ever start an in-store demonstration company. These guys charge a lot of money, but they don't make any money. It's really, really hard to be profitable. Um, so let's see. One thing is measuring post-demo velocity. So I get tired of uh, <laughs> anecdotes. Hey, we did a demo. We sold so much. It's like, well, that's great. But what happened afterwards? Because sometimes we have a great demo person that connects with people, but did people like the product? I maybe this is a great place to say it. Like, at, at what we need to ha be as as um, owners of CPG companies is we need to be thinking that we are testing hypotheses. Um, demos are one of the ways we're testing hypotheses. Do people like my demo person? Do people like the product enough to buy it at the store? Great. But do, the, the bigger question is, do they come back and buy it again? So I, I think this post demo lift is is um is really really important. So hey, I, I my velocity was this. I did a demo. It popped up over here, and then but then it sustained at a higher level. If it isn't, then one thing to consider is maybe the product needs to be improved, right? So the, again, and not the hypothesis is this is the right product at the right price and the right packaging today. Maybe it's not the right product. Maybe it's not the right price, right? So th these things we need to be always open-minded about um, in order to succeed, in my opinion. So wait until month two to do demos. Yes, don't do demos month one, <laughs> right, Jordan? Because you, you're going to get there, no product will be on shelf in, in half the stores, and you're going to be frustrated, and you still have to pay money. And so month two is a great time to start um, doing that. And then demo in the top 20% of stores. This is this has been my number one learning. Like I want to demo where the people are. I don't want to be demoing in the dog stores, and I don't want to be demoing demoing on the worst days. So if you're launching at Sprouts, go visit Sprout stores and see when they're busiest. I have found typically Saturday and Sundays are great times um, to be there. And then this this is like the pro tip from the guy who owned a demo company: doing demos at the same stores on the same day of the week over two weeks has been the most effective in terms of sustained post-demo lifts. So they're seeing it one, one Saturday. People are tend to be creatures of habits. They shop every Saturday, every Sunday. They see it twice. It's like, hmm, okay. Now it becomes now you now you're becoming more of a staple in their mind. So that that is what I have found to be the best efficacy of demos. By the way, once you do the top 20% of demos and if you find them to be successful, especially relative to post-demo lift, then you'll go to the next 20%, right? Because I consider top 20% to be A, next 20% to be Bs. I'd only focus on A's and Bs if I were you. Luke, how often do you circle back and do demos after those like two weeks? Yeah, okay. So demos I think are great when I'm launching a product. And so like month two, month three. And then ideally I never need to do demos again because they're so expensive. Um, usually brands today are paying over $200 per demo. It's really hard to get an ROI. Um, but I'm thinking about the beginning, the first six months on shelf is like this kind of honeymoon phase. I want to launch strong. I need to get that velocity going. Uh, I, and I, I want to spend more now at the beginning so that I can spend less later. Trying to, and a lot of it has to do, uh, Jordan, is that when we're new, there there is like this halo. That, that, and that Once that fades, everything gets more expensive. That's what I've noticed. And um, it is okay to ask, um, like your buyer, what are the top stores that you yes. can demo there? Like they yep. tell you. That, like for example, um, I I handle the Sprouts account for our company, and I have the top twenty percent of stores. I have A, B, C, D list from them. They're generally pretty open about that. Okay. Okay. So well funded brands. So I work with brands where we're well funded, and where the money is there, please, please, please do merchandise. When you get a launch, you're launching a product. Great, great time. I, I to be doing merchandising. It just, I, every time I've done merchandising, the ROI has been there at the beginning of a launch. Um, so ideally visiting two to three times over a few weeks to make sure that we're on shelf, there's no skew voids, no line voids. We have our, we're, where we're supposed to be on shelf. If it's a less organized division, like Whole Foods so pack, oftentimes you can, you can get like a secondary placement on your own with your merchandisers. Um, Price tags are in place. If there's IRCs, like instant redeemable coupons, they can be applying those for you to create extra velocity. Um, and then I already said it, created, creating the secondary placements. 
after launch, merchandising should be considered when a product or brand voids are growing. So when you're seeing the data, like in KE Connect, for example, hey, I'm noticing 20% of stores haven't purchased in three months. I first off want to notify my category manager at the retailer about that. And then I'm going to do my part if I have the money and go make sure I'm on shelf and talk to those department managers. And also early January, I've done this many times where that's kind of like the new new year, new you time. And it's usually like the highest velocity month for most natural CPG brands. So it's a great time to to be uh, making sure you're on shelf. And it's a great, maybe to earlier question, Jordan, that the other time I would do demos again in the future after launch would be in January. People are open to new products and considering new behaviors and habits. Love that. Um, promotional strategies, I love testing promotional strategies. It's one of my um, things I love to geek out on. I think um, most brands here are earlier stage. So your goal is to build awareness, get product in people's mouths. That's what we're trying to do with promotional strategy. Ideally that they like it. And, and you know, I think I have a graph here. Yep, I'll show it to you. So this is, um, this is I believe here, dollar or unit velocity or over a period, it looks like a, looks like a 12 month period across here, right? By week. And what I'm what I'm seeing here is we're we're testing different um, promo promo SRPs. So 299, 279, two for six, two for five, um, three for ten, three for eight. For this brand, we actually found that two for six was the the sweet spot for them um, in terms of margin and velocity growth. And in this case, we actually were able to get the retailer to do um, after this one year had passed to do an everyday two for six was our EDLP, and it really drove velocity. Um, Sprouts, for example, can do that. It doesn't just have to be a, a, a single price. It can be an everyday two for a price. But you can see here, the, the black lines are, this one's lower than this one. This is a beautiful, beautiful graph, Jordan. It's like, this is our velocity before. We did a promo, people tried it. Guess what? People liked it. We got a new, a new post, post promotional velocity, right? And what we're doing here is testing all these different price points to see which one drives the, the most lift during a promo, and then which one, more importantly, drives a post-promotional lift um, for our for our brand. So um, don't I a lot of people just do one promotional strategy. And I'm strongly suggesting that you consider testing four or five that first year um, to figure out which word which one works the best. Okay. With that too, what's the best data approach to understand what's working? Like if you're a small team under five people? Is it looking at like weekly sales data or just like mm -hmm. your own velocity or cases that you're selling to that yeah. retailer? Yeah. There's different definitions of what I'm going to say, but I'll, I'll tell you what my definition is. I'm, I'm looking with Kehi and now Unify has that new 2.5% program where I think everyone's going to have data going forward. Um, I'm looking, if I can't afford spins and I don't have access to a portal like Whole Foods where I can actually see the velocity every week, um, I'm looking at sell-in data from the distributor to the retailer. Um, and then I'm I'm able to hypothesize like they're probably not buying product they're not selling. <laughs> so then I get a I get a general idea of how the velocity is performing by using Kehi and Unify sell-in data to retailers. Where I'm in a Wegmans, it's beautiful, Jordan, because I can see my velocity and everyone in my category. At Whole Foods, I can see my performance every week. Right. So so some some brands I work with, we try to be very intentional about the, the initial retailers where we can get the free data from. Whole Foods in particular that. is a big win. Jamie uh, had a question that asked yeah. about how long do you think it takes to ramp up? They said they're grow going velocities. I think maybe just like a, a, a st they're like standard or steady velocity. Great question. Like I call it maturity mm -hmm. and yeah, it, it really varies on how good you are at testing promotional strategy where you're using merchandisers. So it's like, it could take five years, right? If you're, if you're really not pulling all the levers and maybe because you can't pull all the levers. Um, but it's, but I'd say for a brand well-funded where we're able to pull all the levers, typically about two years in is where we'll see it. I'm thinking of a, of a plant-based meat line where I'm an investor and on the board and I work with them on sales. And on this one, we started off at Whole Foods so packed with like three, and, and so we had over the next year, we changed our packaging twice, lowered our retails, um, changed the quality of our product. And so like this idea of like max of, 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 um, really hitting mature velocity 
like in our case, required a lot of changes because we were, we were, we were taking the feedback loop from our hypothesis testing and we got it right. So three went to 10 and 10 became our mature velocity. So and that was the, 10 units per store per week. Yep. Yep. Double digit. And so at, at, at Whole Foods, like in, in that department, double digits where you need to be. And so we hit it. And so when we were at three, we were scared to death, yeah. which is good because we <laughs> made a lot of changes. Um, going back to this slide, I forgot to cover something on the merchandising. Um, if you cannot afford merchandising, I, I, there's a really cool plant-based milk brand I worked with where um, we would pull the, we would look for voids that were coming up in like the, in the distributor data. And then we were able to just call the stores and talk to the department manager, have a conversation. We would um, send them a swag package with a t-shirt at the time they were um, the COVID masks and we sent them coupons for free product. And we built a relationship with these stores and it worked. Like it, it saved a lot of money over hiring merchandisers, but um, it worked well. I I did get my hand slapped with Sprouts for doing this once. So I don't recommend, I recommend being careful and being gentle and being mindful because these guys are really busy and they can't talk to every single brand. Um, but in terms of a street fighting approach, um, you can, I mean, you, you get their phone number, you can call and see if they'll help you. Okay. Um, Stay close to your category manager. So you're on shelf, you're going, um, but do not be annoying. <laughs> so uh, weekly emails is probably too much. Monthly emails probably okay. Um, if they don't respond to that monthly email, I often I often ask buyers when I'm presenting to them, like, um, hey, how do you how do how should I handle it if you don't respond to a message? Should I just like email you every day? Or and I've had so many buyers say, you know what, I get a thousand emails a day. I get to 200 of them and the rest, I just basically dump. <laughs> so it's like, if you email me every day, it's probably the best way to do it. Some will say, don't annoy me by emailing me. Every so it's really good to check in on that. Um, and then, and then be able to behave accordingly. So present line extensions, exclusive launch queues, like for like whole foods and sprouts, especially they love that where you can give them three months or four months. Um, and it, it just continues to deepen the relationship when you're giving them exclusive launches after you've already launched your line. Um, Let's see, you can obtain data sometimes, like um, a mother's, for example, has been really generous in, in sharing data Again, try not to be annoying. And our goal, like this is, takes a lot of work for them. So we don't want to bug them too much, but maybe quarterly I could reach out for some data from the retailer. Um, we can talk about promotional performance. We can ideate ideas, um, good ideas for special, for special uh, marketing activities. So like, this is like on the left-hand side, this is Bristol Farms. They have like meet the founder series. So whenever we launch a, a product at Bristol Farms, we just say, hey, can we get connected with marketing? And then we talk to marketing and see what they might have that might pertain. There could be a special uh, focus on, for example, we have a brand that's Whole30, that's focusing on Whole30 this month, and we could be part of that. Or they're doing a podcast, so they're doing Instagram posts so we could cross-promote each other. And so I would say, I'm going to repeat this, always ask the category manager to connect to you if it's okay to connect with their marketing team, if they can connect and give the introduction. Why not? <laughs> In general, it's... In general, it's free marketing and sometimes there's a cost, but it could be really, really efficient money for you. Okay. Marketing levers. So yes, as I said, I'm repeating it here. Always ask the category manager to connect to the marketing team. Social nature. Um, I've tried this a few times with brands and um, I use the word blunt. I use the word blunt. It means crazy expensive, especially if you're a smaller brand, but it works. Um, <laughs> There's a brand that we launched on, innovate, on the innovation table at Sprouts. We got them into the inline set a few months ago. Um, they did this. They paid $25,000. The social nature will literally drive people to stores um, and cause them to buy your product. They get basically the product for free. They're required to write a review. Um, doesn't matter to most of you today, but those reviews can actually be syndicated. Um, for example, if you get launched at Target, those reviews can actually be launched, can be syndicated into their online platform from day one. Um, so if you if you have to hit velocity and maybe you're not doing it in other ways, this this will help you get there. Um, Isle's another tool. Um, I've, I've been a part of it. It's kind of text-based. I get I basically would, would be able to go to a store. Um, I, I would take a picture of a receipt pr proving that I purchased a product at like a Kroger or a Sprouts. And then I get them, I get 50% back, 100% back. And um, that's it, it, it does drive velocity. Again, blunt in terms of it, it is very, very expensive, um, but it can get the job done. Most brands can't afford this, but I just want to make sure you know that this is an option. 
uh, digital coupons can be really simple um, for a younger brand to use in that you can put a budget on it. You can say, I'm willing to spend $4,000 on digital coupons. And at $4,000, there's no more digital coupons available. So it's a great way to control your costs. Um, remember that with coupons versus TPRs or promotions at shelf, you fund always 100% plus the clip fees and processing fees, right? So a dollar off probably costs you a dollar ten, if not a bit more. Where a TPR, where at shelf I'm maybe marking it down by a dollar, might only cost me sixty cents, because oftentimes the retailer wants to be margin percent whole, not margin dollar whole. So just something to be aware of. It's a tool that that can be effective. Also, digital coupons are only effective in, in my years of experience if they're aggressive, 35% or more, ideally 50%. Otherwise, they're just getting clipped and, and nothing ever happens. No one ever actually uses them. Um, Instacart is my number one tool go to today. Um, when I meet, so I, as I said, I handle the Sprouts account for, for my company, for my clients. And I, I, I now sit with the buyers and they're like, hey, this brand that you're, that you're working with us on has lower penetration in in online than than this other brand. So you're at 12%, this other brand's 18. For Sprouts, for example, in some categories, they're having 15 to 20% of the purchases are happening through Instacart. It's massive. And what's great for an emerging brand is you can snipe your competitors. You can buy their names. And and again, you can set budgets here as well, just like you can with digital coupons. Jordan, did you use this with your, with your business at all? We didn't use Instacart at the time, but I work with a lot of brands who do, and it's extremely effective. Um, I know there's a founder on the call, right? No, or, or not a founder, but someone who works for a company uh, right now on the call who uses Instacart a lot and has seen a lot of success there. Yeah, it's the number one thing I recommend today. It, 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 it has to happen. And in fact, when I'm meeting with Sprouts, for example, like I just said, they're like, why aren't you doing more? <laughs> like, like if you're, if you're not, if you're not at 15% of sales from D to C through this Instacart channel, then you're missing out on sales. And especially as an emerging brand, we, we need to be able to snipe that business from the bigger competitors. Yeah. So, and they've overhauled their advertising platform where it's more similar to like what Amazon advertising yes. is now and being able to like really go in and do targeted campaigns yep. and promote certain products. And it's really sophisticated now. Yeah. Agreed. So I can't say enough about Instacart today. So just, just count it as being said. Right. Influencers. I don't know. Jordan, have you seen Bobby Parrish? Funny enough, my wife and I discovered him about a month ago, mm -hmm. and like we both have the apps on our phone now. He's amazing. So where he has organically discovered my brands at Sprouts and Publix and Whole Foods, we can literally see the velocity go through the roof. It's, it's almost like being on a Netflix documentary nowadays for an, for an emerging brand. Netflix blues crazy needles too. Um, this guy is $25,000 to work with, I think, right now. So it's expensive, but social nature is twenty five thousand dollars. So if I had a choice, if I had the money, I you know I might consider a Bobby. Um, his his uh his following really follows him, and he can totally drive intent to buy into in stores. There, he's a great example of like for me, he's the best example. But there's also lookalikes that cost a lot less um, that you could try out with and start building building a um, an audience with with them. Um, Bobby also is in, invests in companies too, so it's an an option to. Um, have him give you called sweat equity, where he might actually um, do promotions for you while being an owner of your company. I know he doesn't do that for everybody, but it's a, it's a potential way of proceeding that, that can help a company that doesn't have as much um, capital on hand. Um, tracking your success. So I already talked about this a little bit, so you won't go too deep. Yeah. How do we know if we're winning? Again, we, we asked the buyer up front, like, what is the velocity target? We get data from the category manager. We also can get it from from um, the distributor portals or from spins. Um, and I think this is a really good point. All that matters is feedback from the category manager and how I'm closing the gap, um, distributor flow rate, stock status. So this is really like, at the end of the day, the category manager has to be happy. <laughs> so whatever they're focused on, you're focused on. Um, and for established brands, like we, we do this for like middle-sized brands, like we'll dig into like a three hour deep dive where we're buying spins and we're looking at ACV by region and, you know, ARP and analyzing our competitors. Most emerging brands, um, at this point can't afford this, but, um, I know that spins has some new programs that are making it a bit more accessible. Okay. So that is my story on how to drive velocity and, I put on here my my email address and anyone's um, welcome to to reach out and happy to spend some time with you talking about what we do and how we help brands grow and 
with that, Jordan, I'll pass it back to you. Any questions? Perfect. Thank you so much, Luke. That was extremely valuable. I know you could probably talk about an hour on each one of those slides yes. <laughs> in detail with all the complexities, but I want to open up to Q&A from our audience. So if you have a question, feel free to um, let me know in the chat and just say, I have a question or let me know, and we can um, call you up to you to ask that. Luke, Drew asked if you could put your email in the chat so that they can get in touch. Sure. And then very good. And by the way, anyone reaching out, just make sure you 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 mentioned that you found me through this uh through this episode of 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 Jordan's show. Um and then I, I will give you a discount as well. Um just wanted to make sure we're honoring your community, Jordan. Perfect. And thank you for that. So Kareen has a question. I am the founder of a small family-run freeze-dried candy business operate under a cottage food license. We are currently in two local st single grocery stores. Being that we can only sell within the local area, are there any tips for targeting local stores? How do you get your brand visible while following the college food rules? Sounds great. So if you're if you're self, I think she said she's self distributing. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. So I I think um, visiting the stores I think is the number one thing you can do, and and bringing samples and and I, I don't know how to put it like there's there's like people who are a bit over aggressive that could really turn off a buyer. Uh, especially because most stores are understaffed and they work really hard. So I, I find them less grumpy in the morning early. A lot, a lot of people in grocery, um, especially department managers, start around 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. So when the store first opens, it's a great time to be stopping by and ask them if they have space and and then certainly just tell them a little bit about your product. Ideally, you 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 don't hold them for 10 minutes while you go through an entire deck. You're able to kind of hit the salient points in like two minutes and ideally have them try the product. And I, especially for self-distributing, I mean, you can get a number of authorizations that way. Um, you can also try calling. Calling worked really well during COVID, but I'm finding that calling is not working as well anymore. In-person visits, why not? Building that connection is the way. Um, Jordan, have you, when you were building your brand, is that what you kind of did too? Yeah, we did a lot of uh, on the ground going in person. I think one thing that's important when you're first starting out as well is understanding the relative velocity that you can expect for those smaller stores yeah. because some get decent amount of foot traffic, but it might be just for core items that they sell. Um, so really getting an understanding, like, can I sell two units mm -hmm. per store per week or am I selling 15 units per store per week? Because it gives you a sense of the scale and size that your business could be, mm -hmm. right? If you're doing demos in a small store, we worked with um, a group called Sugar Beet Co-op in the Chicagoland area in Oak Park. Um, and right, like a great clientele, but there just was not that high of foot traffic. It was kind of slow and steady throughout the day. And so there was a relatively low um, kind of top velocity that we could probably reach at, at that time. So that's also a good way of, kind of understanding the potential. Mm -hmm. And what, because for me, as you're sharing that is also consider, you know, that when you're delivering product to stores, um, you're not marketing your business, you're not, you know, working in R&D, you're not like, oftentimes, like you're not working, you're kind of, I've seen too many brands spend more time than the ideal doing deliveries. Um, and a lot of deliveries that do not have an ROI that makes sense. Um, consider local distributors like in San Diego, there's a great guy, um, a great Ukrainian guy named, um, at the sea, Seacoast is the name of the, of the company. And Val is the owner and he has, he delivers, he merchandises, he has great relationships. If you connect with him, he'll help sell your product for you. So you can do what you do best, which might, whatever that is, whatever your genius is, you can go focus on your genius. I love that. So question from Tiffany. I know this is a tough one. What is a realistic budget for marketing and advertising? And maybe a better, another way of framing it is how do you think about Luke? Like when you're talking about setting a marketing mm -hmm. or advertising budget or goal, yeah. how do you talk founders through that? Yeah, I think I'm going to share something really quick. This is old yeah. data. So this is from Propeller, which does accounting for, I don't know, thousands of companies that are venture capital backed in our space. Um, and so if you see here, this is like revenue under 2 million, under 6 million or 12 million, look at what their, their trade spend. So this is like um, TPRs, right? Promotional spends, the cost of working with KHE and Unify is 22% of, of um, gross revenue. And then marketing is 24% of, of net revenue. And if a brand only has 45% margin, then that's all the margin it's gone, right? So this is this model is great if you raise a ton of capital. 
typically what I think of as like benchmarks today for an emerging brand is like 16 to 18% on the kind of that, that adjustment between gross sales and net sales, which is the funding TPRs, the cost of doing business with Kehi and Unify. And then on the marketing side, where I was just, I was showing you in that deck, like the way the coconut cult does it, right? Like I, I would hope that's almost zero. Like ideally it's two, 3% of your, of your net, net revenue. Um, but that I just don't see the ROI for a smaller brand to be able to, it's like boiling the ocean as a smaller brand, trying to make a difference by doing paid media in the digital, digital area, in my opinion. Totally agree. All right. And then another question as well, are there, are retailers able to track sales at other stores? So as an example, target buyers can see how you're doing at Walmart. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The classic example is like Publix looking Publix is a, is a follower, not usually the people that would launch, which makes sense for conventional, but they're going to look at what's happening at Harris Teeter. They're going to look at what's happening at Earth Fair, right? And, and the fresh market. So yes, they can see that. And then this is the core thing, right? Our, maybe one quick point, Jordan, is that, that my philosophy, and I imagine yours is too, it's really about, about uh, depth versus width, right? I really want to make sure that the retailers that I'm starting out with I win like crazy in those accounts because that's the data story that will make everything else possible. One of my favorite brands who did this really well is a company called Bomani and they do an alcoholic like espresso um, that was sold in stores and they launched in a number of Whole Foods stores, but in a, the New York-ish area and they were doing demos, I think like every other day in the store. And okay. their whole goal was to say, I want 95, 100% of the people who shop at this store yep. to know our product. Not everyone's going to buy, but how can I maximize the the penetration per store so that everyone there knows us, has maybe tried it and can buy versus only 2% of shoppers knowing about your product and a wide amount of stores? Yep. Yep. I agree. A hundred percent. I'm thinking, is it a Poppy and another um, brand that's not really popular right now? That that was how they did it. And they, 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 and really, if you think about it, this idea of testing hypothesis, that's what they did. And they did it in a in a in a smaller sandbox that didn't cost a fortune, right? And then you learn. Um, the the biggest mistake I see brands making today is not having a strategy regarding where they're going to be selling their product. Um, I was at Expo and when brand was saying, "Why well, I, I did like the, the Albertsons pitch slam? I did the Whole Foods. I did." Yeah, and I was like, "Okay, well, if you want Albertsons, would you want Albertsons? <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> like no, like let's be really intentful." <laughs> so, well, and then the other thing too is that. If your product is not selling, like if you're doing everything you can to sell your product in five grocery stores and it's not selling, expanding yep. to 50 grocery stores is not going to fix the problem. Yep. And a lot of brands do that because they think like, oh, let me get the initial revenue from the orders because yep. I'm not making enough money, but then yep. you're just going to lose more money later. Yeah. And I I, I was a, a big investor in a company and we had, we had gotten uh, one of the best um, branding companies in the country to do our branding. I thought we had the best product. And so we were launched into Jimbo's and Mother's and and the velocity wasn't great. And then Sprout said yes. And I was like, let's go do it. <laughs> and I would never recommend my brands do this, but I'm like, as an owner, I'm like, let's go do this. And we ended up failing. And and I was like, we just did an after action review at my house a couple of weeks ago, my business partner. And we just realized that that we we were already knowing that the product wasn't selling that well. What were we thinking? Like we just got we got like the bug. And so I understand as a person who invests in this space, like I get it, but it's like the lesson is learned. Like we must have a smaller sandbox where it's cheaper to learn and iterate. Yes. Awesome. So question from Julie, we are currently running demos at Whole Foods. The demos are driving significant velocity for stores that actually have enough inventory. Would you suggest a targeted social nature campaign versus demos to see if there's a further lift? If you had to choose between the two, since they are both so expensive. We demos. will absolutely review performance, post demo, social media to see if there's a sustained yeah. lift. Yeah, I think demos. I think at, at the end of the day, um, I call social nature the blunt tool in that it's going to give me a one-time lift, but I haven't seen great post post social nature lifts. Where demos with the right product, right time, right packaging. In fact, packaging less important. Am I doing demos? If my packaging isn't great, like the fact it tastes good, I win in that situation, right? Um, I think demos are 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 preferred in my opinion to social nature if I can afford it. Now, I know you have a demo company as well. Have you seen any recently like a pairing a demo with a tool like Isle where you say, hey, if you buy during this demo, give us your phone number or email and you can get 50% off or 25% off to then 
be able to remarket to those customers later. Yeah, fantastic. So first off, IO allows you to remarket. It lets you build up an SMS database. Uh, that, that's part of their platform is to be able to do that. As I understand it, that may have changed, but that, yeah. at least three months ago, that's how they operated. Um, but in terms of social nature, that that could definitely be it. Because right, the way that social nature works, you don't you don't have communication with those people. So I love that idea. I've never seen it done, but I love the creativity and I think it would be very effective. Awesome, I love that. And let's see. Oh yeah, Drew just asked thoughts on, on Isle. Um, yeah, I think right, like with a lot of these things, they can get very relatively expensive depending on what your goals are. Yeah. Um, there are ways to replicate what Isle does on mm -hmm. a small scale, right? If you're only doing a demo or two a week, yep. you can have set up a, you know, your own number or a Google voice number, have people text you mm -hmm. and just reply back and say, Hey, what's your, you know, send me a picture of the receipt. What's your yep. Venmo or Zelle number and just send it totally. from your account. You totally could do that. Yeah. Like wh why not? And yeah, I, I really, Social nature, like in Isle, made sense. Like in the, if you think about Sprouts, you have the whole innovation program, which probably applies to a lot of people on this on this program today, right? Um, that's where it can make sense. I only have three months. It has to perform month two and month early month three, or I'm falling off shelf, right? I won't. So I think in that situation, I just have to make it happen. Um, that's that's where I think those tools can be really valuable. If I'm building a longer term business, and I and it's I know it's the intention of the buyers for it to be longer term, then that I, I think I can be a bit more conservative and, and not have to use those blunt tools. Yeah, that's a good point. Cause we've also, I've talked to other founders who are like, Hey, I have a category review coming up. Our velocities aren't where we want them, okay. but we need more time. And yep. so can we do a campaign for two months, yep. get to be, yep. you know, stay on shelf and then have a year to yeah, there we go. Out after that. Pull the blend tool out. Yeah. Much better to who have tested the hypothesis, got the packaging product pricing and everything right. And, and then have that naturally happening and figure out your TPR strategy. But if that didn't happen, and you still haven't figured it out, then that's a tool to keep you on shelf. Exactly. I love that. Um, I know you mentioned Bobby Parrish. I'm happy that you did because I've, uh, as I mentioned, like we've been using him recently. Have you found that there's a expanding number of, I call them loosely, just like influencers in the health food space that are driving purchases, or is it a handful? Like, are there 50 Bobby Parishes, yeah. or are there really five? Yeah. So I met with. Um someone who works for Five City, which is like, I think the organization that he's part of. And they have, they have about a hundred or so, I believe influencers that are part of that. And then there's, then I found his, his, um, what do you call it? His agent. And then that agent also represents hundreds of people. So I haven't fully tested. I just know that for three brands I work with, Bobby made the difference and, um, and no one else has, no one else has. There's never been an influencer I've ever seen who's ever moved the needle anywhere near what Bobby has done. Wow. I love that. Awesome. Well, eh, we have time for another question or two. So if anyone has anything to finish up, but Luke, I just want to thank you for this. And I know you're generous to kind of offer your support to our community as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to just give a, a quick overview on the ways that you can help the founders on the call. Very good. So we operate in a lot of areas, but the four key ones is number one, um, for those of you working with Kahane Unify and large other large distributors, we have a team that helps you understand your deductions and then also can fight back. We find that 10% of deductions in general are erroneous, not because Kahane Unify want to steal from you, but just because it's it's all like these manual systems behind the scenes setting things up. So we actually take the domain your domain. So we operate it as you reaching out to K Unify. We know how to escalate, we know how to get money back. And I just, we work with small brands, like literally I'm just getting started up to like, I would say 50, $60 million a year brand. So it's, it's something that applies to everybody. Uh, we also do accounting for, and we do it very efficiently. I was getting very frustrated with some of the accounting services out there and their cost. Um, so both, both um, accounting and deduction management, I set up a corporation in the Philippines that I own and and we have an amazing team of CPAs over there that are just super efficient and love being in the details. So that, that's just kind of our, our hack to help emerging brands do it more efficiently. Um, we also do a lot of consulting. I'm famous for a three hour deep dive where we kind of look at your purpose, mission values. We do a SWOT analysis, like what are your strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And then we do what are called OKRs, which is basically goal setting that are specific and measurable and who owns it. Um, I think that's one of the most valuable things that we do as a company is like, even if you don't want to use me for anything else, let's just go spend three hours talking about your brand so we can be very strategic about how you proceed. It'll save you money in the future. I'm, I'm, I, I 
find it to be very valuable. And then the fourth thing we do is we represent brands into the 70 key natural retailers in America. Like I mentioned, I personally handle Sprouts. Um, we handle Whole Foods, Fresh Time, Fresh Market, Natural Grocers, you know, Air One, Bristol, all the way down to like a Berkeley Bowl up in Berkeley with two stores. But we try to get brands up to about 50% ACV, ACV. And it's all about that that hypothesis testing, Jordan, where we, we're just saying, okay, we work great with people who are, who are humble and that we look at all this as a hypothesis that we're testing together. And then once we get on shelf, we're testing the hypothesis of these promotional strategies. And um, and then our goal is to be as efficient as possible with people's money in that process. So those are the four key things we do. Awesome. I love that. And then can you, I know it's a little complicated. Can you describe what ACV is? ACV means all commodity value. And ACV can mean a lot of different things, but it generally means like the, the whole market. And I'll give you an example. Jimbo's um, over indexes for ACV because their stores are high volume. So even though there's only four stores, the ACV equivalent is almost like eight normal stores. Um, so th the idea is as, as a brand, and I'm using like syndicated data like Spins or Nielsen, um, the ACV tells me not only how many stores I have, right, which is less relevant, but how much of the total potential market am I penetrating with my product? And so I could have a hundred really dog stores that I'll have low ACV, or I could have a hundred amazing stores with higher velocities. And by the way, I want the hundred with higher velocities that are higher ACV um, is, is the focus. I love that. And so I know Luke, you're also offering a, a discount for brands who come in through the food baby community. And so the reason I invited you on too, is because you have both the strategic insight of how to be successful and then also very like tactical and executional mm -hmm. ways not saying like this is what you should do go do it right like you actually go out into the and market and do these things yeah. for brands so you can actually help figure out that strategy which is really good so you understand who to say no to as well mm -hmm. and avoid yeah. those bad opportunities um and then also make sure you're getting your core set to then support your team or the founder to go out and make those sales so that they can be successful and drive that velocity once they're in store. That's it. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's exact. That's exactly it. It's, it's, um, it's one thing to be up in the sky, but the other, and it's great. We need to have that strategy, but then we need to go do it. And that we're, that, as you said, that's, we, we, we try to do both. That's, that's what we do. Yeah. And you're personally talking to retailers as well. So you're getting like yeah the feedback that's going on in Live. market. It's not five, 10 years old. Yeah, that's a great point. I didn't used to handle sprouts for my company. And then I decided it was really good for me to be tactile and to be actually going out twice a month to Phoenix to go meet with all these people. And I've grown so much by doing that. It means so much to be in front of an actual retailer. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining today. If you have questions, email Luke, email myself. We're happy to get those answered and to help move your product forward. So thanks so much, everyone. And as I mentioned, this was recorded. So we'll send out the recording of this either tomorrow or Friday um, so that you can go back and re-listen to anything that you may have missed. Thanks so much for joining us. And also keep an eye out for, you can register for our next webinar, which is happening on April 24th, which is an Amazon 201 driving sales and growth. So if you're selling on Amazon and looking to find how to be even more successful there, be sure to web register for that webinar. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jordan.